In today's culture, we tend to think of self-sufficiency as a great virtue. Uh, to know that if a problem comes up, you'll be able to handle things for yourself. We don't like to think of ourselves as being dependent on anyone else for help, for any kind of help. Uh, we think of it as something uh, shameful or weak to do. And I think that uh, competence is a virtue. Being able to confront those problems when they come up and knowing what to do uh, to help out yourself and others is a good thing. But the attitude that people tend to get uh, when they have that competence, uh, that capability, I guess we could say, is a sort of prideful self-sufficiency. And from a scriptural standpoint, uh, that's a real problem. And that's what I want to talk about today. I think that you hear men being accused of this a lot. And it's certainly true, though. Uh, I think women do it, too. Uh, guys, you, know, you often hear uh, they won't ask for directions when they're lost. Or they won't look at instructions to figure out how to try to do things or to assemble something. Uh, if they're having money problems or other personal problems, they try to keep it to themselves. And there's something really, I guess we could say, appealing about the I can handle it all by myself attitude. And I'm not just pointing fingers at others. You know, I'll admit that I fall into this line of thinking sometimes too. I really admire the uh, early American pioneers uh, for this very reason. I think the Little House on the Prairie books, and it was a TV series too, um, if you ever read it or saw it. Um, I like them and uh, reading about how they had to deal with every problem that they came up against uh, with no help from the government or anyone else but themselves. It's a kind of charming, romantic notion, I think. A man, his wife, uh, and his two little girls build this cabin out in the wild prairie, uh, completely away from civilization, and they get their farm going from the ground up uh, without a Lowe's or a Home Depot in sight. It gets me motivated reading about stories like that, and it makes me get into that spirit of desiring self-sufficiency. Like, wow, could I take care of myself out in the wilderness? Things like that. But what does God have to say about this? One thing that he doesn't say is God helps those who help themselves. I know that that's a, uh, it's a popular expression, but it isn't in the Bible. And he doesn't say, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps either. And he definitely doesn't say, ask the government to pull up your own bootstraps for you. And uh, don't get me wrong, uh, he's not saying that you should... Uh, go make yourself dependent on anybody else either, uh, since we're running with that line of thinking. Uh, the government, friends, 401ks, uh, even family members, they all have their limits as to how reliable they're going to be. Uh, even the biggest institutions will fail you. In the Old Testament, uh, Israel is warned against putting their trust in the military might of Egypt. Uh, God calls Egypt a broken staff of reed, and anybody that leans on it, it's going to snap and the staff is going to pierce through their hand. And at, and at the time, uh, there wasn't any safer power on which to place your bets than on Egypt. So even big governments and big institutions or big corporations, they're all going to have their day where they just can't stand up to the challenges. They're not going to be enough. God wants our reliance, our trust, our vision uh, to be on one person, on him. And I think that this ties into why the Bible uh, warns against money and riches so often. It's not that it's wrong uh, or a sin to have money or even to be wealthy. But when you've built up your life around a dependence on money, uh, you tend to think of money as the most important thing, the end goal, the end all be all. And someone who thinks like this uh, has they've put money atop their own scale of values in the place of God, where God should be. If you think about what you value most, you know, there's, uh, you know, things that are kind of material that you need, but you can live without that. Whatever's atop your scale of value is really what you're just striving toward your whole life. And is it money or is it God? Let's read a couple of verses uh, from the Bible uh, in Hopefully these will explain what I'm talking about here. 
Let's start in the book of Matthew, the first book in the New Testament. And we'll look at Matthew chapter 19, starting in verse 23. And Jesus is talking to his disciples here. And in verse uh, 23, he said, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Uh, we see Jesus Christ saying there that it's hard for a wealthy person to get to heaven. And why? Uh, it's um, kind of a confusing thing, I think, to say, because it's not like there's a certain tax bracket that if you're in, you're going to get kicked out of heaven when you die. Well, it's easy, I think, for a wealthy person to think that they don't need anything, uh, that any unforeseen expenses or illnesses or tragedies uh, that pop up, medical bills or something, uh, that they'll be able to handle all those things on their own with their money. It's hard to tell a person like that that they're in need of something. They tend to believe that they have everything that they could need. And of course, uh, the first step in being saved by Jesus Christ is admitting the need for salvation. And that's why uh, the verse says what it says there. It's not that, again, you're automatically condemned if you're in a certain tax bracket. And it's not that the solution is to immediately sell off or give away all of your wealth. Uh, that won't really do it either. Uh, that's why it's the love of money, uh, not money itself, that's condemned as the root of all evil. Again, uh, the popular phrase is a misconstruction of the actual text. We hear that a lot, uh, that money is the root of all evil. But when we see where it actually is in the Bible, it says something a little bit different. Uh, let's actually take a look at those verses. Uh, it's in 1 Timothy, uh, near the end of the New Testament, some of the last books that Paul wrote, if you're not super familiar with your Bibles. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting in verse 9. He says, But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which, while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Notice that the warning here isn't to those who are already rich. It's to those who are seeking to become rich, because they're the ones who are most likely going to be relying on money as the thing that will set them up, uh, that will make them self-sufficient. Uh, think back to the uh, stories that you hear about what happened when the stock market crashed in 1929 uh, on Black Tuesday. Uh, that signaled the start of the Great Depression, right? And a lot of people who had invested in the market, uh, who had put their reliance on the money that they'd made, suddenly found all of their security swept out from under them. And that's why, at the time, uh, you had a lot of people committing suicide, so let's take a look at a parable of Jesus Christ's that goes over a similar situation. Uh, turn back to the book of Luke in chapter 12. And let me find my place there. Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 15. Again, this is a parable that he's saying here. And he said unto them, Take heed, and beware of covetousness. For man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? It's kind of, you know, first world problems. His farm's doing so well that he has produce, you know, overflowing, and his barn's not big enough. Verse 18, and he said, 
This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So there's a man, that rich farmer in the parable there, who thought that he was self-sufficient. He had more produce than he knew what to do with. Uh, He expanded. Uh, He built bigger barns and he thought he was all good. Uh, He thought nothing could harm him. Uh, He told himself, well, you know, these are going to be the golden years coming up. I can just sit back and relax now. But we see what God thinks of that man and of that man's attitude. Uh, Thou fool, he says. Uh, Everything that man was relying on uh, could be taken away from him in an instant. Uh, God tells him that he's going to die that night. It doesn't say how. Maybe he had a heart attack or something. So, We can see that, according to the Bible, uh, trusting in wealth and material resources uh, for self-sufficiency is a bad idea, generally. Uh, But there are other ways that self-sufficiency manifests. It doesn't just have to be about money. A doomsday prepper uh, might not be rich. Uh, Probably not if they've spent all their money on the things that preppers buy. I don't know, underground bunkers and rations and usually lots of weapons. But a person like that uh, has the same mindset as the rich Wall Street broker. He looks around at everyone else and he thinks, huh, well, I'm set. Uh, Everyone else has been messing around, not paying attention to their own security. Uh, But when the storm clouds burst, I'm going to be just fine. I've got my bunker. I've got my guns. Everything's going to be great. Well, you know, You hope so, but you never know, right? Now, I think there's probably been a lot of people uh, throughout history who thought that they were were prepared to face some great challenge or great evil and then just folded when push came to shove. And I'm talking in apocalyptic terms here, uh, but think about how this attitude looks in everyday scenarios. Do you ever... uh, make plans with your family or friends and then get irritated when everything falls apart or goes wrong? Are you one of those uh, people who feel secure, uh, sufficient, if you have an agenda to follow through on? Uh, Say you're going on vacation and you have a bullet point list of everything you want to do. And then you get mad when it doesn't work out, uh, when the family members aren't cooperating, or when, uh, for one reason or another, everything falls apart. So, here's a good example, I think, of what we're talking about here. Uh, How much are you currently paying for insurance? Or, I guess I I should say, uh, how important is insurance to you? Uh, If you want to have it, fine, Uh, but what's your attitude towards it? Uh, Do you rest easy at night knowing that if you get sick, the insurance will cover it? Uh, If you get in a wreck the insurance will cover it, or if you die, uh, the life insurance will cover it. And does that peace of mind come from uh, paying hundreds of dollars a month in anticipation of worst case scenarios to companies that usually won't even cover the full cost when something actually does happen? Uh, But the doomsday prepper is a weird one, right? (laughs) At least, well, you know, at least they have something material to show for their spending. They've got guns, food, and water stored up. Uh, But the respectable suit-and-tie types who make insurance their god, uh, they'll look down on the doomsday prepper, and they think they'll say that he's wasting his money. But they're really all in the same boat. As humans, uh, we're scared of the future. Uh, We want to anticipate every scenario, everything that could possibly happen. And when we think that we have, uh, we relax into that self-sufficient attitude. Uh, We... Rest easy at night, not because we're thinking about eternity or spiritual things, but because we're thinking about our insurance policies. But let's see what the Bible uh, says about this mindset. Turn back a ways to the book of James, 
We're going to uh, quite a bit of different uh, passages of Scripture today. In the book of James, chapter 4, starting at verse 13, we read this. Go to now, ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city, and continue there a year, and buy and sell, and get gain. Whereas ye you know, you know not what shall be on the morrow. Uh, for what is your life? It is even a vapor, that appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live, and do this or do that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. The key, I think, to those verses there is uh, verse 15. Um, it's the attitude that we should have when we make plans for either the immediate future or the distant future. Uh, ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or do that. Repeating verse thir uh, 15 again. If God allows it, I'll do so and so or such and such. Uh, so you don't give up planning altogether, obviously, right? Uh, but you allow room for God to change your plans if they need to be changed. You don't cling to your agenda or your uh, security blankets uh, like they're going to save you, uh, like you see people do with their insurance policies or with their summer plans or their five-year plans. And this is really, you know, I can kind of relate to dealing with these issues, because this is the attitude that I've tried to have uh, when making these Bible study videos. Uh, they're kind of hard uh, for me to make, because I'm trying to keep an open ear for what God wants when I make them. Uh, with the literature videos and the booktube uh, types of videos I've made, uh, the other ones on my channel, uh, there's not really that concern. Uh, but since these studies are dealing with scripture, uh, I'm trying to be careful uh, not to say something that I don't really believe or that I don't think God would want me to say. And there have been times in the past few months where I would get an idea for a video to do and I started typing up notes for it, uh, but then I would hit a sort of roadblock. And then I try to pray about it. Uh, and sometimes I, you know, it's hard to describe, but you know, I just get the feeling, well, God doesn't want you to make that video quite yet. And when I get that feeling, I uh, change plans. I make another video or I take a break for a while and I do something else. Because at the end of the day, uh, I don't want to put out a video about the Bible that God doesn't want me to make. I know that my YouTube channel uh, and my Rumble channel, uh, because I'm on Rumble now too, uh, so if you have a Rumble account, go check it out there. Um, I know that, uh, those channels, uh, would grow faster, uh, if I was more consistent in, uh, putting out videos every week or something like that. But all of that is, um, again, like it says in the book of James, if the Lord wills it, uh, if he doesn't, I can try every trick in the book, uh, to boost my views, to get more subscribers. And this channel still won't go anywhere. And it's the same uh, with wearing masks to protect from diseases, which I mentioned a couple of videos back. Uh, if God wants you to get sick, uh, you're going to get sick. Uh, and it doesn't matter if you're wearing three masks and a Darth Vader helmet or something. Uh, and if he wants you healthy, uh, you can go skipping through a quarantine ward, singing the Star Spangled Banner at the top of your lungs, and you're not going to get infected with anything. I don't want to go off on too big of a tangent there because I talked about it in the past videos. But anyway, um, over planning uh, is another type of self-sufficiency uh, that we've just covered. And there's a third type of self-sufficiency that I want to talk about now uh, since we've covered uh, monetary self-sufficiency and over planning self-sufficiency. Uh, now I want to look at uh, religious self-sufficiency, which uh, in the Bible is the most dangerous of all of them. And let's start uh, by, again, turning back to the book of Luke. Almost to the same place. Uh, Luke chapter 18. Uh, 
And here's a, uh, another uh, parable that Jesus is telling about uh, a Pharisee who in the first century in Judea was a religious leader, a very strict religious leader, um, following the law and everything like that. And it's between the Pharisee and the publican. And a publican was basically a tax collector for the Roman Empire. Uh, they were really looked down on uh, by the other citizens. And that's because, one, you know, they were servants of the oppressor. They were stealing money and sending it off to Rome. But also the publicans would often be not the most reputable uh, people uh, to begin with. Uh, they would uh, charge, they would take more than they were supposed to from the people when they were taxing them, uh, and they were kind of seen as these low lives. So in Luke chapter 18, verse 9, uh, we read, And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. So already in verse 9 there, it's establishing who Jesus is talking to. Uh, this is a story for those who trust in themselves. Uh, that they're certain that they're righteous. He says in verse 10, Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven. But he smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. So you see there, that the Pharisee's prayer wasn't really a prayer at all. It was more like a boast. You know, he's bragging about how much more religious and spiritual he is than other men, and how the fasts and uh, and how he fasts and how he gives charity to people all the time. And it's clear that he thinks he's in good standing with God because of the actions that he's done. Uh, emphasis on he. But the publican, in contrast, he uh, knows that he's not a good person. He doesn't have any uh, private devotion or charitable works to rely on. He's taken an honest look at his life as a tax collector, uh, probably unsaved, and he doesn't like what he sees. And he thinks, well, if religion is what's going to get me into heaven, I don't have it and I'm not going. And so all he can do is ask for mercy. And what, just, what does uh, Jesus say? He says that the publican went home justified and the Pharisee didn't because the publican recognized that he couldn't save himself uh, by his own efforts, by his own righteousness. Uh, the Pharisee clearly uh, thought that he already had and that there was no reason to ask God for mercy because he did, hadn't done anything wrong. And you know, a lot of people today are like that. Um... They connect the idea of going to heaven, uh, if they believe in heaven at all, uh, with being a good person, a righteous person. But if you're a good person, then why does the Bible say that Jesus Christ died for you? Uh, what was there a reason for him to die for, uh, to pay that penalty of sin with his own blood like I talked about in my last video? It says in the book of Romans that there's none righteous, uh, that there's none that doeth good, no, not one. So someone with this self-sufficient mindset may think that they're doing okay. Uh, they've never uh, killed, cheated, or stolen anything, but it's not going to be enough. And what do you do with that information? Do you rail against God for making his standards too high? Or do you accept what God's offering you not as a reward for your own efforts and your own merit, but as a gift um, out of mercy. Uh, why is it so important that you get to heaven by your own righteousness and not by God's? Well, for someone like the publican in the parable, it's not so important. Uh, he knows what he's worth, uh, and it's not much. But uh, for someone with a self-sufficient mindset, 
uh, it really goads on their ego. Uh, it goads on their pride that they wouldn't be good enough. Let's um, turn back uh, to the beginning of the Bible uh, in the book of Genesis uh, to see what this pride looks like. Um, this ego when people are too caught up in their own uh, righteousness. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 6. Sorry, Genesis chapter 11, starting in verse 6. And this might be a familiar story uh, to a lot of people. It's about the Tower of Babel. <laughs> Actually, let's uh, start in verse 1. On my notes that I got on my screen there, I had the wrong thing written down. So Genesis chapter 11, verse 1. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and, they be, and, uh, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. So, uh, what's going on here? Uh, does God really think uh, that men are going to be able to build a brick and mortar tower that can reach up into heaven? Of course not. Uh, but he sees that the uh, spirit behind the attempt, uh, the spirit of trying to reach heaven by one's own efforts, by one's own self-sufficiency, uh, self uh, he sees that spirit and he sees the danger in it. So he scatters them uh, because uh, putting their trust in numbers is just as much an error of thinking as putting trust in money or in one's own competence. And really, it's funny because thousands of years later, we see uh, politicians all across the globe who still haven't learned this lesson. Uh, listen to their speeches sometimes. Oh, we can uh, come together. We can unite. Uh, there, and when we do, there's nothing that we can't solve. We can defeat global warming. Uh, we can defeat the pandemic. Uh, we can eliminate poverty. Well, you know, think again. I think the Bible would respond. Um, all of human history illustrates that our mortal attempts at utopia fail over and over again. Uh, every genuinely bright idea someone has, has had uh, has been twisted and corrupted and brought about misery or death of some kind or the other. Uh, there's been a lot of good done too, don't get me wrong. Uh, but there's always consequences of some kind or another that we don't foresee uh, because obviously uh, we're operating from a limited perspective. Uh, Edmund Burke talked about that in his Reflection on the Revolution in France. Uh, it's a good work to check out. People try to implement a system or a policy that seems great, uh, but because there are so many variables... Uh, because human beings are so unpredictable, uh, there's no way of knowing whether the damage that they're going to cause will outweigh the benefits. It's attempting to play God with other people's lives, um, all out of this sense of superior intellect and self-sufficiency. And now we've come to the big question. Why doesn't God like self-sufficiency? Is it because he's jealous? <laughs> uh, is he afraid someone's going to hit on a system or a scheme of things better than what he can design? No. I mean, 
you know, that'd just be silly. But uh, I think the reason he warns against it and the reason he doesn't like it is because he's condemning it out of mercy. He knows that we'll be better off being reliant on him than being reliant on ourselves. And there's a really good illustration of this uh, back in the Old Testament, in the book of Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 2, uh, verse 13, we read this. God's talking here. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. A cistern is a tank for storing water. And God's saying there that people have hewed themselves out or made uh, broken, cracked cisterns where they could have been drinking from the fountain of living waters. So when you have the option between the two, why would you choose the broken cisterns? Well, because they had pride in making them themselves and their self-sufficiency. God knows that when we try to do everything for ourselves, even if we have the best of intentions, it's still not going to be as good as what he can do for us. And for an example of this, let's turn to one final place, uh, to the book of Philippians, uh, back in the New Testament. Uh, And here in the book of Philippians, in uh, chapter 3, we have Paul. Uh, the Apostle Paul, who's actually, you know, he writes a good chunk of the New Testament. And he's talking about all of his credentials, all of the things to his credit. And he's talking about how they're really worthless in comparison to what God can do for him. And he actually lists several things here. Uh, Several things that in first century Judea would have been seen as uh, exceptionally holy. Uh, People would look at someone like that and think, uh, wow, you know, this guy really has his act together. He says in uh, verse 4, chapter 3, verse 4, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. So those are all um, good things from a first century Jew's standard. But keep reading here. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And again, uh, you can see that the idea of righteousness comes into play there. Paul calls his own righteousness dung, excrement, poo-poo. Uh, the best that he could do on his own may have impressed other people, may have uh, gotten him a certain amount of admiration in the streets when he's passing by, but it's still just a drop in the bucket compared to what God can do. And wouldn't you want to make God your friend? Uh, Wouldn't you want to have him there with you for all the trials that you're going to go through? Uh, Leaning on the everlasting arms, as the hymn says. There might be something appealing or romantic in the idea of uh, facing all of life's problems on your own. Uh, But if we're all honest with ourselves, I think that we can acknowledge that a day is going to come when we'll run up against something that we just can't face on our own. And when that day comes, uh, you see that all the money you've saved up in your bank account is dung. And all of your college degrees, I've I've got two of them on the wall over there, dung. Your life insurance policies, your reputation in the church or in the community, you know, all dung, excrement. 
uh, those things are good and well uh, right up until the instant that they aren't. Uh, then they depreciate in value pretty fast. God doesn't depreciate in value. He never becomes less dependable. And so I think it's a wise choice. It's a choice that I've made. And well, hopefully if you're watching this video, you've already made or you're thinking about making. Um, I'm sticking with him. Self-sufficiency. I mean, I've seen how many times I hit the snooze button in the morning uh, before uh, to put too much trust in myself. Um, I've seen how I've messed up random everyday things that you would think I would know by uh, like the back of my hand. Uh, I've messed them up randomly. Um, Self-sufficient? No. I wouldn't trust me over God. So um, I hope that this was a beneficial study. I'm actually recording this on Christmas Day, uh, so I hope everyone's having a uh, good time, having some great food, maybe, and reflecting on the season and on the reasons that we celebrate Christmas. So uh, I'll see you all next time, and thanks for watching.